Hello and welcome to the second video in the series on ARM assembly language programming. Um, in the first video, we talked about the resources that I am using to collect the information for this class. And the links to these in, uh, documents were in the description of the first video. In this one, we will talk about the platform itself, uh, the CPU later platform. The link to the platform is in the description of the video. If you like, you can uh, take a look. You can follow me uh, throughout the video, or you can watch the whole video and then um, uh, do it on your own if you like. So let me explain that platform um, to you. So the uh, CPU platform essentially, um, or the CPU later um, simulator is actually a platform that allows you to write code and emulate or simulate the program without having to have the actual platform itself. Uh, when you go to the website uh, directly, uh, it will again the link is in the description of the video. You can check it out. Uh, you will it will take you to a landing page that has all these uh, different uh, architectures and the systems for that architecture. So, for example, that simulator can uh, let you. Um, run code for the NEOS processor, ARM v7, MIPS, and RISC processors. And the environment that it can simulate can be either generic or running on the DE1 SOC board. If you don't know this board, um, that's OK. We're not going to be using too much in this class uh, from this board, but we might refer to it from time to time. Um, and you can also run or you can choose the architecture to be the ARM v7, which is the architecture that we're going to use for this class. And you can select the generic version of it, or you can select the ARM v7 DE1 SOC uh, version. Now, you might ask yourself, what is the difference between um, the DE1 SOC and the generic version? Um, and maybe you're wondering, what, which one should I use? Um, I know sometimes if you're like really interested in this topic, you're like not sure how to set up the IDE or the environment. So if you select the ARMv7 generic and you click go, it will show you an environment that has only the CPU, only the Cortex um, ARM processor that will run the code that you type in this editor. Okay. On the other hand, if you select the DE1 SOC, it will show you some of the peripherals that actually come on the board. If you if you take a look at the board like itself, the physical actual board, it has a bunch of resources. Like it has switches, it has push buttons, it has seven segment LEDs, it has a JTAG UART port, and so on. And if you want to write code that interacts or um, this environment will simulate the interaction between these peripherals and your code, then you can use the DE1 SOC version of this. So for example, I can flip these switches by clicking on them with the mouse. And then if I'm reading values from that address, um, I will read the values based on what I select, right? And then you can uh, push some values or write some values to this address. For example, this address is FF2. 0, 0, 0, 2, 0 in hex. So if you write some values to that address, it will turn on or off the seven segment uh, or the segments in the seven segment LED display and so on. So really the only difference between the DE1 SOC version and the generic one is whether or not you're using only the ARM microcontroller here or the peripherals that come with the board itself. Now, uh, whether you use the generic or the D1 SOC version of this platform, you do get a bunch of functions and displays and um, uh, windows that you can use to trace or debug your code, see what's happening, and so forth. So let's take a look at some of these windows and see what do they do. So the first one, uh, like we mentioned in the previous program, it's is the editor, and this is basically where you type your code. So if I want to write something quickly, let's say I want to move um, or preload, basically, register R0 with the emitted value 4, that's where the code goes here uh, in. And then you can, if you're inclined, you can end it with the .end directive, if you like. Once you assemble this code and you load it to the board, uh, it goes to the disassembly. So this disassembly window will show you the instruction and its equivalent hex value. So this is the actual binary that will get loaded into the CPU or into the Cortex uh, microcontroller and get executed. 
and it shows you the address at which the instruction actually lives in memory. Later on, when we actually write uh, variables and we try to put some variables in memory and then write some code, uh, you will see also the values for these variables living in memory. And you can double check and see the values that you load into the register, whether or not they match what you have in memory. Maybe you did something incorrectly or something's gone. So it helps you kind of debug the code that you have. And then the third tab here is the memory. So this is the entire address space available to you. You can scroll all the way down. You know, if you have a big, rather big code or small code, you can see what's happening inside your memory. And the right hand side here is um, the values that you can uh, interpolate, in, uh, interpolate in memory. So later, again, later down the road, we will write some code, for example, and we'll have a variable and we'll have, let's say the variable will have a value of five. Then you will see the ASCII represent um, equivalent of that five in memory. If you have the letter, let's say H in, as in like hello world, the letter H, you will see its value in ASCII in this side. But right now, we only have an instruction that loads one value into the register. So we don't see anything that makes any sense in English for us in this um, area of the window. While we're at it, um, this setting window here that you have allows you to um, customize the way you want to look at the content in memory. For example, right now, those values are grouped in words. So the length of this value is actually 32 bits. And 32 bits is four bytes. Four bytes is equal to a word. And if I change this, for example, from a word to a byte, you will see that those values are now grouped into one byte um, at a time. And uh, if you remember from hex discussion, or if you remember how to convert from binary to hex, um, each hex value is actually four bits. So for example, this value E3 is eight bits. So that's one byte. So that byte has a value E3 in it. Um, you can also um, select the type of information you want to see, like you want to see it in hexadecimal, unsigned decimal, or signed decimal. So you can click on this one, you see the values in their decimal instead of hex if you want. Um, most of the time we use the hexadecimal values because it's um, maybe easier to read or convert between bits and hex. So again, later down the road, we might be, uh, we might need to actually take a look at memory and see, uh, okay, I have the value of X. Uh, what does that, what does that mean? Like I'm, I'm moving the value of say four into, or 16 into a register. 16 in hex is um, one zero. So it's easier to see one zero than to actually see the, the decimal value of, um, of that number, or if it's a larger number, rather, maybe that would be a better example. It might be easier to see it in hex than in decimal. And then the other one is the number of words or memory words per row. You can have it as one. So now each row that you have here has only one word, only one 32 bit value is displayed for you per line. And, or you can do um, two, four, eight, or 16. The default is four. So it displays four um, addresses for you and um, or actually four words rather for you per row. Um, so let me, again, since we're discussing this, I'll uh, talk a little bit about the addresses. If you notice that the address here starts at, at zero and those addresses correspond to um, those cells that you have here. Okay, so if you notice, if you count this line, you will you, you will count actually 16 values. So like zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And then the next line obviously will start at address 16. 16 in hex is one zero. So this is address 16. So it starts here. Okay. Um, if I do it one, uh, one word at a time, I also see that um, this one, so each row is now one word, a word is four bytes. And because I have four bytes, I need four addresses to store that value. And that's why you see the address go from, uh, goes from zero to four, because I am occupying four addresses for this word. Um, it's just a coincidence that my mouse is not, here we go, it's clicking now. So zero, 
um, of 0, 4, 0, 0, A0, and E3. Those values occupy four bytes, require four bytes to be stored in memory. Each address in memory stores one byte, and therefore those or this value requires four addresses, 0, 1, 2, 3, and then the next address will be address 4. Now, going to other areas in this uh, that, uh, in this environment, you have the registers here. Those are the available registers for you in user mode. You see that you have register R0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to 12. You have the stack pointer, the link register, the program counter, and then you have the CPSR, current program status register. Um, this will tell us the conditions at which the program is running right now. Um, we'll talk about the CPSR later, but nonetheless, you have these registers. Um, so if you're inclined again to trace your code and you want to see what value is being loaded to the program counter, and you may know or you may not, the program counter points to the address of the next instruction, not the instruction itself, but the address of the next instruction. So if you're trying to debug some code that involves like some branching and looping, and then something is not working correctly, it's a good idea usually to see what's being loaded into the program counter. And you go to that address and you see if you meant to jump or not jump to that address. Um, other things here that might be helpful, um, if you have any breakpoints, you can take a look and see. We don't have any here, but they will be listed here if you have any breakpoints. Any symbols that we were using, and in our case, we do have, for example, the underscore start symbol and starts at address zero. So if we define more symbols in the code, they will be located here as well. And then the last uh, few things I will mention here is um, those buttons that you have on the top. Um, you have the step into, step over, step out, continue, stop, restart, and reload. Uh, they're pretty easy to understand. Uh, basically, you can either uh, step through a line of the code, step over the line of the code, step into it. Um, so if you're branching, you want to step into the branch, it will actually take you to the branch. But if you step over, it will complete the branch and come back to where it was. Um, if you click continue, it will execute the entire code. Stop will stop the code and then restart will load the code or start the code from the beginning. Um, so let's do here another another instruction. Let's say I want to do move R1 and I want to, let's say, put the value of 10 into R1. If I assemble and load, um, again, these are the instructions that I have in my code. If I step over the first one, let me go back to my registers. I loaded the value of 4 into R0. Here it is. If a value in a register has changed, it will highlight it with uh, in the color pink or red. Um, if you go to memory, uh, also if something changes here, it will highlight it for you as well. We're not writing anything to memory right, right now, so it's not going to make a lot of sense right now, so we'll stick to the disassembly. And then the next instruction, if I step over it, it will load the value 10 into R1. Um, 10 in, in decimal is equal to A in hex, so we see the letter A being stored into R1. If I want to restart my code, I simply click on restart. It will go back to the first instruction that I have. And then again, I can step through it. Um, another one to do, for example, if you if you want to put like a breakpoint to debug your code, let's say I have um, another instruction here. So it makes, uh, I'll show you this R2, uh, let's say the value of 14. Uh, I can put a breakpoint so I can allow the code to execute until it reaches this breakpoint. So before I run the code, I do put the breakpoint here, and then I click on continue, and simply the code will execute all the instructions above the breakpoints, and then it will stop at this instruction. So now it stopped at this address, which is address zero, and this is the instruction of moving the value 16 into R1. If I click on continue, it will execute that instruction, and the rest of the program. So let's restart here one more time. I'm gonna step over, step over, step over. The value 14 is E in hex, and I do see the value E stored into this register. So that's it. Um, feel free to, again, uh, do these modifications in the environment to your liking. Uh, and then if you want to look at your code later on, you know how to debug it or where to look at whether if you want to go to memory or if you want to go back to the editor and edit, edit the instructions and whatnot. 
uh, hopefully this video was helpful to kind of navigate the environment that we'll be using the cpu later and it gave you a sense of why we're using the uh the just the arm system the generic arm system because we're focusing right now only on the uh, microcontroller itself we're writing code that deals only with the microcontroller and the memory with it we're not dealing with peripherals but down the road if you want to do stuff with buttons or switches and the seven segment leds then we can use the de1 soc board um, i will actually also um, encourage you if you want you can look up or google like the one soc board and just take a look at the a picture of it to see what it looks like if you don't have one um, anyway not to worry this simulator will be able to simulate uh, almost everything that we can do on the DE1 SOC board when we use it with the Cortex um, microcontroller. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.